الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear sisters and brothers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank him and we ask him for help and guidance. And we bear witness that there is no deity to be worshipped but Allah. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his last messenger, sent as a true guidance to mankind so that we could follow his example at all times, all places, and under all circumstances. I start with the prayer of Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, My Lord, expand my chest with ease and make my task easy for me to carry out and loosen a part of my tongue so that they could understand my speech. And I find this dua especially important this evening because the topic is one that we need to fully understand. It is a topic that is very important to all of us, men and women. Interestingly enough, one of the brothers asked me today when he read the title of the presentation, can men attend this presentation? So I told them, I am attending myself, so I don't see why not. Even though it is about women, but as you will find out, that this artificial division is un-Islamic. And the unfortunate thing is that they started to attribute it to Islam, and then Muslims took a defensive stand when they need not take such a defensive stand. So I will start right at the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in many places of the Qur'an and especially at the beginning of Surah An-Nisa. أستعيذ بالله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء O mankind, be God-fearing who created you from a single kind of nafs, and that is Adam alayhi salam. And then from that nafs, he created its companion spouse, and from both of them created multitudes of men and women. And in Surah Al-Hujurat, we read, Ya ayyuha nas inna khalaqnakum مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى O mankind, we created you from a male and a female. So this indicates that both the male and the female are the origin of the creation and they are the basis of this human kind. The controversy that was widespread in Europe even as late as the year 538 AD, a little bit before the advent of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they had a decisive conference to decide whether women have a soul like men do. It was something that really mattered to them to decide whether women were really human beings or not. And when they decided that yes, they do have a soul, they were unable to decide that she is not a property that belongs to men. And that continued even as late as the beginning of the 20th century. We know that it was only lately uh, something that came about that women 
started to be recognized as people who can participate in the society. But even until now, where I come from Canada, in the province of Ontario, the controversy is widespread about equality between men and women. Why? Because equality between men and women for non-Muslims and unfortunately for many Muslims is a totally misunderstood concept. Equality between men and women. I will get to that insha'Allah. But let us again go back to the beginning because if you understand the beginning it will be easier to carry on and establish a better understanding of the role of men and women in the society. I will make it for both. It's not only the role of, how can you understand the role of women if you do not understand the role of men? Both of them have a role in the society. So I will inshallah talk about that. Brothers and sisters, we just said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hujurat, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female. So it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the humankind will be based on a male and a female. Yet we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam first, the male. He did not create them both at the same time. And some people ask why? Before I continue, I always advise my brothers and sisters, don't ever allow yourself to ascertain something that is only a speculation for us as human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left things that he did not want us to know as of yet. And unfortunately, I cannot go into the details of this because I am talking about something else. But there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept to himself. He told us about one such thing so that we will not wonder about it, the nature of the soul, a ruh. People asked about it and they are still wondering. So he said, O oh Muhammad, O oh Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they ask you concerning the ruh, tell them the knowledge of that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You only possess little bit of knowledge, so don't ask much about it. You should be contented by saying that there are so much that we were allowed to know. Therefore, whatever I'm going to say now, by no means is something that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ascertained for us. But we were allowed by the Quran and by the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to look and ponder. And as long as we do not break the rules of thinking and we keep our manners as Muslims, we are allowed to look into the greatness of our Islam. So we just observe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Prophet Adam alayhi salam alone. And we say, well, it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is going to propagate the humankind from Adam as well as his female spouse. Why didn't he create both of them at the same time? Some people say, well, because males are better than females. No, that is far from being the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created Adam, he placed him in his home that he created before he created Adam. So when Adam was created, his home was ready for him. And that is, inshallah, our home that we are heading to. We are only here traveling. And we are heading, inshallah, in that direction to go back home to Jannah, where our father Adam was placed at home. Jannah, the most perfect place you can ever think of. Everything is perfect. No diseases, no illnesses, no pollution. Nothing is missing. Everything is there in its perfect state. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed Adam there. And he wanted Adam to enjoy it. Adam enjoyed so much, but then he felt lonely. He felt that he needed to share that beauty with someone else. As if, Wallahu A'lam, God knows best. 
as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Adam and his children after him to feel the need to share life with their halal female spouses. He wanted Adam to feel that need, even though everything was his. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to experience life alone. And Adam could not continue alone. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his companion spouse. By the way, her name is not mentioned in the Quran. The name of Adam is mentioned in the Quran. But what people say as Hawa or Eve was not mentioned in the Quran. These are the accounts that Muslims found in the stories of Bani Israel. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us and gave us the guidance that whenever you find something that does not go contrary to the teachings of the Quran, you may entertain it without affirming its truth. Many of the details that Muslims nowadays relate and they say that this happened to this and this and this, many of them are stories from Bani Israel. But the Quran, whatever the Quran said is the absolute truth. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ The Quran was referred to as the truth. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whosoever wants to believe is welcome to do so. And whosoever doesn't want to is allowed to do so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no compulsion in religion. لا إكراه في الدين. Therefore, Hawa, let us say Hawa, his companion wife, was created from the same kind of soul that Adam was created of. The same. من نفس واحدة. من نفس واحدة. So they were both created and then Adam was created, he felt the need, Hawa was created, and they lived together, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that their children should not take Jannah for granted, and that they have to earn their way to live at home. So he took Adam and Hawa and placed them on earth, and that's where we are living, so that we can go through life and determine whether we deserve to go back home or whether we need to pass by another place to be cleansed before we go back home. And for some, billah, there's no hope of cleansing at all. And they have to dwell therein for eternity in that place that we know as the hellfire, Jahannam. But our intention, inshallah, is to go back home. So this is what you have to make dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us enter Jannah without getting us to go to the hellfire if we deserve to be cleansed because no one will enter Jannah unless they are absolutely pure and clean no one so brothers and sisters we were created from Adam and Hawa and both of them were equal but are they the same? this is what I want to get at the confusion that people have about the concept of equality. They confuse it with being identical. If you want males and females to be equal, then they have to do exactly the same thing. They have to be identical. Nothing that the men do should not be allowed for women to do. They have to do or they should have the ability to do things exactly the same. So this is the confusion between equality and identity. The premise is, the premise is, both males and females are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some females may be superior to males and some males may be superior to females. The only criterion is Taqwa. Taqwa is the only criterion for both males and females. So there's no distinction. Some of the females achieved great success 
in their search for knowledge, like Hadrat Aisha. We know that there were men who used to come and learn the tradition and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from her. And there were many other women who excelled as Muslims. And the fact that they are females did not put any hindrance in their way. So brothers and sisters, if we are equal, why are we different? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this life to be based on the work of a male that females cannot do and the work of females that males cannot do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted certain things to be done by the male and certain things to be done by the female. Had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished or decreed, he would have created the human race from one gender. It's his creation. He can do anything he wishes. We know that the earth worm, are you familiar with the earth worm? We have lots of them in Canada and they come out in the spring. Now the earth worm, there's no male or female, it's one gender. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a system, we know that the general rule that all of his creation, whether plants, whether animals, whether humans, it's that, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا All things, animals, plants, humans, males, females, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not controlled by his rules. He creates the rules. Rules do not control Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for every rule that he created, he created something to show us that he is not bound by the rules that bound us human beings. The rule is that we do not understand the language of animals. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala broke that rule with Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam to show us that he is not bound by those rules. He created them. He created them. No one was ever able to speak directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala broke that rule with Prophet Musa alayhi salam. No one, no one can go away from the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that these rules are his own making. Therefore, therefore, we find that there is something for males to do and something for females to do. But today, they are saying that no, we've got to be able to establish that equality to do anything and everything that whether males or females do. And we say to that, it is impossible. It is impossible. And not only that, it is unacceptable. And I will now start coming to contemporary times and start to talk about things that we really have to appreciate. Now, I cannot, because of time restrictions, talk about the rights of women that they enjoyed throughout the ages. But again, we are not here to try to talk to ourselves about something that we know exists. We know that Islam came to dignify women. Islam came to dignify women. Islam came to the Jahiliya society of the Arab society where women were commodities. That if the head of the household dies, then his oldest son will inherit his women folks. So the women of the family will become the property of the oldest son. Women were not able to inherit property. They were not able to, to they went as far as burying female children alive so that they will escape the defamation of any possibility if war would ever break out that females will be taken away and then they will dishonor their family. So they used to get rid of them and that was easily done. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says to those people, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُؤِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ 
and on the day of judgment when that buried live infant would be asked what was your sin that you committed to deserve being buried alive so how could you do that to a live human being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created so Islam came to liberate women and dignify them and let me ask ourselves brothers and sisters why is it that whenever there are rules and regulations people look at them as restrictions that cannot be acceptable in a civilized system they look at the systems of family law according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they say oh look how you you know in Islam you say that males have double the share of females in inheritance and when you need a witness then it has to be two males two females for every male and that in Islam you allow four wives for the man and that you know divorce is something that is only the right of men and this and that now I would like towards the end of my presentation to have questions entertained if I may because I do not believe in monologues I do not want to say something that you already know so I would leave it to you if you are interested in a certain aspect inshallah I will try to elaborate on that but let me inshallah try to set the pace and then allow you to help me to continue inshallah by asking you relevant questions those questions that are asking for clarification because those questions that are meant to hit at the heart of our Islam will be regarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not favorably not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like people to know Islam encourages people to seek knowledge but only if they have the intention to seek knowledge not not to try to put an obstacle between real knowledge and their own understanding because many times we ask a question we already had formulated the answer in our minds we already know the answer but we ask the question anyway and while the person is giving us the answer we are not listening we are forming the rebuttal we are trying to think how are we going to rebut what he is saying to us and answer him back so what happens an argument we start to argue with each other why because one is talking the other is not listening and thinking how am I going to answer and show that I'm intelligent enough to try to tell him that he or she doesn't know what they are talking about I'm not saying this that I am not allowing this because this is I am only presenting something which is not mine something I live by but it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as I try to gather it I am only here a person who gathered the information to share it with us the information is not mine I try to go away from opinion I try to seek knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah as I study the Sunnah inshallah so I hope that when we ask the question we are asking for the sake of knowledge inshallah so you may want to ask about inheritance about witnessing about all the other issues that you may be interested in but let us continue brothers and sisters regarding the way we are living nowadays the problem that we face is that we often judge Islam or let's say any system against the most familiar standard that we know and that cannot be right now many people who are living in the West are familiar with the Western standard of social systems they are familiar with a system whereby women dress freely the way they like no rules no restrictions and when I say no rules no restrictions you know what I mean they can go as far as having their own clubs whereby they can have no clothes whatsoever and in a city called Guelph which is one hour away from where I live in London Ontario 
Four years ago, there was a court case about some girls who walked into the park topless. Why? Because, well, if men can do it in the summer, why can't we? This is equality. You see, this is what I would like to start by saying. Their understanding of equality is unrestricted freedom. Can we accept this as civilized, unrestricted freedom? But are you allowed to drive on the interstate with any speed you wish? You can't. The cops will stop you and will give you a ticket. So you have a restricted freedom. Can you go outside and park wherever you please? No. You don't have a freedom that your freedom is restricted. But people try to identify certain restrictions as being civilized and others they came to view as being civilization. And this civilization is showing by statistics that it had failed and it had failed miserably. It had failed miserably. In the city of London that once was a conservative town, the rate of teenage pregnancy was 29% higher than the average of the province of Ontario, 29% higher. Common law cohabitation is 17% higher in the city of London than the rest of the province of Ontario. And they look at it as something that they accept. They look at it as civilization when their daughter reaches 17, 18 and doesn't come home to say, well, this is my boyfriend, that there's something wrong with that girl. We have to take her to a counselor. She doesn't have a boyfriend yet. We Muslims cannot accept that. We have our own system that we cannot measure against their own standard. You cannot measure the way that men and women dress in Islam against their standard of civilization and then say, uh-huh, we are backward because look how our sisters dress. Their women dress in skimpy clothes so they are civilized. Our women dress in a certain way. Oh, they still have years to catch up with the West and their civilization. Just think about this, brothers and sisters. Is this what we want? Is this what we call civilization? Is this how we want our women to view themselves in contemporary society? Don't ever let yourself fall into the trap of measuring yourself as a human being against that standard. We have our own standard that inshallah we have to establish for them because when Islam came, it came for all of mankind. We did not send you only for the Arabs. We sent you for all of mankind. Therefore, it is our duty to teach them the standard of Islam against which they should start to correct their mistakes, against which they should start to change, not us changing to meet their expectations. I have, you know, my daughter who is seven and a half years old. She is not by Sharia required to put on the hijab. She is not required. But she put on the hijab and she walks in the mall with that hijab. And once she came to me and she said, Baba, everybody is looking at me and some of them are smiling. I said, are you doing something wrong? She said, no. I said, well, walk straight and be happy. So she felt so confident. And if we will teach our children the confidence in what Islam is all about, they will grow to project that professional image with the kind of clothes that very soon they will become comfortable with 
and they will start to appreciate and respect us for. Brothers and sisters, by the way, the worst enemy for the sisters not dressing the way that Islam requires them to dress is not non-Muslims, but it is themselves. You are your worst enemy because you are the one who tells yourself, no, I can't. No, I can't. I have to be like everybody else. Conformity. This is the problem we are facing, that we want to conform no matter what the price is. We want to be like everybody else. It once happened with Umar ibn al-Khattab. Have you heard of Umar ibn al-Khattab? Nobody did not hear of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The second Khalifa after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a delegation from Persia wanted to come and meet the Muslim emperor. To them, the leader of that large state has to be like their leader, has to be a big emperor, like their Kisra. So they wanted to come to Medina and meet him. So when they arrived in Medina, they were looking for the huge palace because they said that must be the place where Omar lives. They looked everywhere in Medina. They didn't find any palaces. They said, where's Omar, your leader? People were busy doing their own chores. So they said, we don't know. We don't know. We don't until somebody knew exactly where Omar was and what was he doing. So he said, wait where you are. I will go and tell him you are here. He ran to Omar. What was Omar doing? Omar, Omar, Omar. And you know, lectures can be made about Omar. Omar was holding a bucket with tar and a brush and he was brushing the diseased the skin of the camels that belonged to the treasury of the Muslim nation. He was doing it himself. Omar was doing it himself. So that man came and he was shivering. He said, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a delegation from Persia. And he showed that he was scared that they may discover what Omar was doing. So Omar, as I was saying before, Aisha prayer to some of the brothers, Omar was a very fiery man. He used to get angry. He got so angry with that brother. He said to him, we came here to teach them not to learn from them. To teach them. I am doing what I'm doing. If they want, they can come and see me while I'm doing this. That's how confident Muslims should be. So I say to my brothers and sisters, please, and I will elaborate on this tomorrow evening, inshallah, on our da'wah. The best da'wah we can do is to live as Muslims. According to Islam, according to our Quran and Sunnah, and never be embarrassed. Brothers and sisters, I have to tell you, when I went to dental school, when we used to go to change our clothes and put on our clinic gowns, in the beginning, we used to find strange things. I was in a class of 120 students. 41 of them were Jewish. And some of them were Orthodox Jews. And they were something under their clothes, a piece of cloth with four threats or groups of threats emanating from that piece of cloth representing the four corners of the earth. They wear it under their clothes. Some of them you can see it even coming from under their shirts. They used to do it from day one. No embarrassment. They had the yarmulke on. Did they feel embarrassed about it? 30 or 40 years ago, Jews were persecuted. So you, they used to hide their identity and they used to do something that I warn my brothers and sisters not to do. They wanted to cover up their identity, so they went as far as changing their own names, as we are finding some of the Muslims doing nowadays. Someone's name is Muhammad, he becomes Mike. Adnan becomes Ed. 
They don't want anybody to know that they are Muslims. And even if something happens, they try to conceal their identity in total. Don't do what the Jewish did. Because many of them lost their identity, but the few who kept it, kept it without feeling embarrassed about it. They walk with their yarmulke on. But I was the only Muslim in that class who was careful not to lose my identity in that sea of non-Muslims. So from day one, we had basins to use for washing. They saw me taking my socks off and my shoes and then lifting my feet. And many of them came and they said, but you didn't use your feet to treat the patients, to wash them. Why are you washing your feet? I said, no, I am doing my wudu, ablution, in preparation for my prayer. And then I asked the dean for a place to pray. And he couldn't find it immediately. So I used to pray in any corner of the school that I find. Brothers and sisters, the result was when I was in fourth year dentistry, we had a special masjid at the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Toronto. And there were between 10 and 12 students who now felt that they could uncover their Islamic identity and we used to pray Zuhr and Asr and sometimes Maghrib there before we go home. And everyone showed respect because there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you are a Muslim. You should be very proud of your identity. Brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created men and women for each to do his or her own function, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we know not as he told us in the Quran. Wallahu ya'lam wa antum la ta'lamun. Be careful about this. But what do we find nowadays? Both men and women choose to go outside the house. They have one or two children because of restrictions of the job. Because some may only get one or two children because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them one or two. Don't misunderstand me. But some of them try to restrict their life to meet their job expectations. And what happens? The mother and the father wake up very early and then they have to get ready. And please, sisters, I do not intend to be rude, but I'm your brother and I like to speak openly. I don't like to beat around the bush because we know these things. So let us speak it straight. So the sister wakes much earlier than the husband. Why? Because she wants to take her shower and she wants to spend about half an hour putting on her makeup to look presentable so that when she goes to work, she will have their makeup, her makeup complete to undertake the job that she is doing. And then, and then she goes and wakes up that seven months old baby who wants to sleep and wraps that baby very quickly. And in Canada, takes that baby in the cold when that baby wants to sleep and the baby is crying, but the mother is trying to ignore that and the drives either together with the husband or the husband goes one way, the wife goes another, takes that baby or the other children at the daycare center or the babysitter goes to do what? To get a salary that can hardly be enough to buy a wardrobe to meet the needs of her job. She is getting a salary to buy something for the job, living for the job, ignoring the family for the job. Now, again, I do not intend to give specific examples of some exceptions to the rules that are happening, but on the expense of something. There has to be something that is on the losing end either your health or the spirit of the family or the children or your relationship with your husband. I give you a scenario. The husband and the wife come in the evening. The husband is exhausted. The wife is exhausted. The husband, traditional society, male 
society, uh, oriented society. So he says, it's her job to prepare the meal. Some of them, the exception say, well, I will help her. But most just lie on the couch waiting for that hot meal. The wife is so tired. The wife is so tired. She looks in the fridge. She doesn't find what she really needs. So she opens a can of something, and then she comes to her husband. She says, this is the only thing I found. You are a nice person, so it's okay. You are honey, and this and that. So they sit together, and they eat. The husband, the first week, the first months, cold meals, cold meals, cold meals. And he doesn't feel it. He may not find it relevant to say it, but it starts to reflect on their relationship. He starts to show that dissatisfaction, maybe not by words, but by behavior. He starts to be depressed most of the time. He starts to withdraw most of the times. And the wife never questioned that. And then she starts to ask him, oh, you changed. You are a different person. Let us talk about the children now. The children come from school. Children love affection. Children cannot live without affection. Children love to be hugged and kissed and talked to. They come to the mother. She says, oh, honey, I'm busy now. Okay, just, go. okay, I love you. I love you so much. She takes that child. And you know what happens? She goes onto the TV set, turns it on, says, I love you so much. Watch television. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I talk like this. I don't mind, you know, we laugh, but I hope that our laughter doesn't reflect some kind of hopelessness. Because this is sad. I am daily in contact with family problems that are a direct result of this kind of lifestyle that we brought to ourselves when we listened to what they taught us about equality. Equality means that I cannot vegetate at home. How many times did you hear this, sisters? Please, let us be open. How many times did you say it or heard somebody say it? Or brothers, how many times did you hear it from someone saying, I did not get my degree to vegetate at home? I will discuss with you possibility. Islam is not against education. Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, seeking knowledge is a farida. You know what's farida? Salat is a farida. Salat is a farida, obligatory. Seeking knowledge is the same obligatory on male believers and female believers. Islam said that females should be educated as much as males do. But if there are rules to govern our lives and go by, shall we look at those rules as restrictions and signs of backwardness? We seem to have short-term memory. We forget our past. When Muslims, when they understand how their roles were divided, when husbands and wives knew exactly what their purpose of life is, things were so great and they were able to produce people like Ibn Sina, people like Ar-Razi, people like Al-Khawarizmi, people like Al-Bukhari, people like At-Tirmidhi, people like Ibn Majah. Nowadays, how many Bukharis we have? How many Tirmidhis? How many... Shafi'is, how many Abu Hanifas we have. You know why? Because we allowed the rug to be slipped and taken from underneath our feet. And we followed, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, that a time will come when you will follow non-Muslims even if they go into a cave of an animal, you will follow them. Blindly. Whatever they do, we will do it. Without questioning. They are civilized. We are what they call us third world countries. Underdeveloped. Look at this. Look to this. Under, we are underdeveloped. They are developed countries. Why? Because their 
measure or the stick they use is financial gain. Nothing else. You are as good as your bank account. That's why we find our sisters and our brothers married and their objective is we've got to make as much as possible. Let's seek opportunity. Let's make more. That's why the sisters go out on the expense of the children, producing a generation which is raised by television. Have you ever checked the kind of programming we have between 4 and 7 o'clock in the evening? What do they have on television? The kind of setcoms they have on television between 4 and 7. The kind of television that Muslim mothers are putting their children in front of. What do you expect? Fathers and mothers come crying to me and they say, Brother, please do something. Please. I will tell you a story about a brother in London, Ontario, who does not miss a single prayer without being with the jama'ah at the masjid. Not a single prayer. And once he called me and he was crying. I said, what's the matter? He said, you won't believe what happened to me. I said, what happened? He said, you know my daughter so-and-so? I said, yes. He said, I just received a phone call from her inviting my wife and myself to her wedding. And I never knew that she was about to get married. Imagine, brothers and sisters, your own daughter or your own son just call you at the end when all the plans are finalized. Say, Dad, Mom, I'd like you to be present at my wedding. You never knew about it. You had no participation in the selection process. Nowadays they say, oh, did you hear? I said, what? You see, today, today, we were at one of the malls in Fort Lauderdale, and there was a German woman and she saw my wife with the hijab and she said to her, oh, you know, are you a Muslim? She said, yes. She said, I know we attended a wedding of a Palestinian girl whose parents selected her husband for her. She didn't want that to happen. Poor girl. She was so upset she was ready to run away on the wedding night. But then she paused a little bit and she said, do you know what? Now she is so happy and she is very pleased with the selection of her parents and this and that. And I said to myself, well, how did my parents get married? How did most parents get married, our parents? Nowadays, now in Kuwait, Kuwait, a small Muslim country, you know what's the rate of divorce? 29%. Kuwait, not the state of Florida or, or in Canada and Ontario, Kuwait, 29%, which means that out of every 100 marriages, 29 end in divorce. Why? Because we are not following the Quran and the Sunnah. As I said today, they start the wedding day with belly dancers and with with the music parties and breaking the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they expect the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to them. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless a marriage that started by breaking his rules? How? You know why? Imitation. We'd like to imitate others. Well, my cousin had uh, such and such uh, singer at her wedding. I'd like to get a better one. We have our own tradition of celebrating weddings. Islamic way of celebrating weddings. What happened to it? How many follow that tradition now? So brothers and sisters, I don't want to take much. I already took one hour. And I would like, if allowed, to leave some time for questions and answers if you would allow it. But I would like to end by this. 
the role of men as well as women in today's society is already prescribed in the Quran. Men have a job to do, and that is to go outside, interact with the outside world, get whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them as their share of sustenance. See, don't ever think that if you and your wife go and work together, then you will increase your share of the sustenance allowed for you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't ever think that. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you a certain share, you will only get that share. Even if you, your wife, and all your children will go and work. There's a hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi. I wish that everybody will know the Arabic language to know it in its original language. I will say it first in Arabic and then I will translate it. Abdi, latardayanna bima qasamtu lak. أو لأصلطن عليك الدنيا فتجري فيها كما يجري الوحش في البرية ثم لا يكون لك منها إلا ما قسمت لك. My servant, you would better be content with whatever I have allocated for you in sustenance, or else. I will open the doors of dunya for you and will let you race through dunya seeking fortunes the same as a wild animal will run in the wilderness seeking to hunt for praise and eating. But after all that racing, you will only get from this dunya what I have allocated for you. So sisters, after all of this, aren't we all believers? Why do we attend lectures? Why do we listen to each other? Why do we gather at the masjid to rediscover our Islam? Can we say after all of this that no, 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 I can't. I, ju I just can't. No, let us say that inshallah we will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this very evening to help us to rediscover the proper direction to reorient ourselves in a direction that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our children so that a generation will come that we will be proud of to carry on to carry on the big responsibility and that's when we will say that we have performed our role in this society, the man to seek sustenance and the woman to build a generation. Brothers and sisters, a man can never do the job of a woman. That is why look at most kindergarten classes and grades one and two. Most of the teachers are what? Women. Why? Because they are the ones that can best do that job. Children listen to women much better as a rule. For every rule, there's an exception. So inshallah, I hope that this evening we opened our hearts to each other and maybe held the beginning of the thread to reorient our lives to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, I have a note here. The Quran does not say that Adam was created first. Please explain. Now, many things in the Quran were not directly said as such, but there are many clear references in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam from the elements of earth and then asked the angels to prostrate and here since I mentioned it some people confuse it and they say you know angels prostrated to do they worship Adam no this is the prostration of respect our prostration is prostration of ibadah there's a big difference so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels to prostrate to Adam 
But then the reference is Adam and your Zawj live in Jannah. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةٌ قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ The whole story in Surah Al-Baqarah. By the way, this story is mentioned in the Quran seven times. The story of Adam is mentioned seven times. And you see, this is the beauty of the Quran. Let's say we ask any writer to give us an account of a certain story. Prolific writer, very good writer. They will write it in their own style. Ask them, can you rewrite it in a different style? They will try and maybe they will succeed to write it another time in a different style. But in a third, it's stretching it too much. So the Quran, you know, the story of Adam is mentioned seven times, and every time you, write, you read it in the Quran, it's different. The same facts, but narrated, related in different ways. And in those accounts, there is clear evidence that Adam was created first. There is clear evidence that Adam was created first, and that the angels prostrated to Adam when he was alone. So sisters and brothers, if you have a question, now for the sisters who may not want to speak in public, again, you see, let's talk about some of our traditions. You know, you say, oh, why don't you allow sisters to speak in public? It's not a matter of allowing. It's a matter that we treasure our tradition of modesty. Our tradition of modesty. You see, I heard one of the sisters relate an example that is so beautiful. She had a discussion. A sister who is dressed in the Islamic way was talking to a sister who was not yet dressed in the Islamic way. And she, they were talking about it. So she said to her, if you want to give a nice gift to somebody, what do you do to it before you present it to that somebody? She said, I wrap it nicely. I put a nice decoration, nice wrap on it. And then I give it like that. So she said to her, and our sisters are like those beautiful treasures those beautiful gifts that can only be or they can be unwrapped for that special person. So there has to be that special person. No one else has the right to see that treasure. Because when you have a treasure, you like to cover it. So this is just an example. So it is not a matter of allowing or not allowing we have our rules that we respect each other's modesty, and that's why we may not feel comfortable to stand in public and speak, although, although, I have to say it Islamically, nothing stops sister from speaking in such a meeting because we know that when Umar ibn al-Khattab was delivering his sermon about Mahr, he said something wrong. So one of the sisters sitting in the back, exactly as we are sitting now, stood up and she said, Ittaqillaha ya Umar. Fear Allah, O Umar. And he said, what do you want, O sister? So she told him. And then he paused a little bit and he said, Sadaqatil mar'atu wa akhta'a Umar. The sister is true or right and Umar is wrong. So there's nothing wrong with it. But some sisters may choose not to speak in public. Jazakallah khair. How does a single sister find a good believing husband if she does not have a father or any male Muslim relatives? Most important question. 
I am facing this with many of the sisters in Canada, in Ontario especially, and in London specifically. We as a community of immigrants came to these countries 30, 40 years ago, and now our communities are maturing. When we came, we came as young adults with young children. Some of us were not even married. We did not worry about this. Now, the children that were little are not little anymore. They are old enough and they are ready for marriage. How do we deal with this? We cannot accept the practices of non-Muslims whereby, whereby they expect their daughters to go and find a boyfriend Otherwise, there's something wrong with them. For us, it doesn't work that way. We have, as a community, to provide the support system for our brothers and sisters. You know, brothers and sisters, with time, we forgot the tradition of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu not even forgetting it, but we started to look at some of those practices as shameful. I'll give you an example. At the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his Sahaba and the Tabi'een, those who followed, you know what the practice was. If I tell you and I ask you, let's do it now, you will say, but how can we do it? It's embarrassing. You know what they used to do? After the Jama'ah prayer, let's say Zuhr or Maghrib or Asr or whatever, after Jama'ah prayer, after they finish, a man will stand and will say, I have a daughter of that age, of those qualifications. Is there anybody who is interested in marrying my daughter? Or I have a sister of this qualification, of these qualifications, and is ready for marriage. Is there somebody who would like to marry this sister of mine? And then people will follow him after the Salat, and they'll say, I am interested, and they will pursue it. If I ask you to do this now, would you do it? You will say, oh, me? What do you want people to say about me? That I am marketing my daughter or marketing my, my sister? Brothers and sisters, this is the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad You are a product of the teachings of Prophet Muhammad in the Quran and his sunnah. Our community should be so cohesive that for the sister or brother who asked this, if you do not have a brother or a husband, or, uh, sorry, a brother or a father, a male member of the family, let your mother or somebody or yourself talk to a sister in the community who can relate that to her husband or her father or someone she knows and let that practice take place in our communities then you have nothing to worry about. I have a list with me of brothers and sisters. And then whenever I find that this is eligible for that, I introduce the families to each other and I say, you continue. I do not partake in the details. Let them carry on. Let them carry on after I introduce it. Why? We have that response. It's a moral responsibility. It's a moral, social, religious responsibility. You cannot say, oh, it's embarrassing for us to do that. For this sister, there is a solution in Islam, insha'Allah. Now, there's nothing wrong also in establishing a confidential office within the community which will receive which will receive information about people who are ready for marriage and that confidential office will put the people across each other and let them carry on what's wrong with that brother usman what's wrong with that nothing wrong we, mashallah it already exists so alhamdulillah this inshallah will be the way to carry on. What are your views on four wives? I don't have a personal view on this. It's in the Quran. Whenever there is a teaching in the Quran, 
we don't have a place for our own view. If you don't understand something in the Quran, it is much more dignified to say, Subhanallah, I don't understand it, but I accept it because this is in the Quran. That was the manner of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever he would tell them something they would not understand, you know their manners, you know what they used to say? Sadaqta ya Rasulallah. They wouldn't understand anything about something he would say, but they would say, Sadaqta ya Rasulallah, you told the truth, O Messenger of Allah. Like in the Quran, many places tells about the spherical shape of the earth and how the earth and the sun and the moon move to a Bedouin living in a flat desert when you tell him that وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ دَحَاهَا after that the earth was made spherical when you tell them that and he's living in a flat desert it won't make sense to that person but they used to say صَدَقْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ this is the Quran it is revealed to you and you are relating it to us we cannot argue with this the Quran says and let me mention this four wives Islam did not come to open the door for men to marry more than one woman. No. On the contrary, Islam came to put severe restrictions on men marrying innumerable number of women. Before Islam, men used to marry as many women as they wished. And it was morally acceptable. It was a sign of power. The head of the tribe should have more than one wife. I will stop. I, I see whenever you want me to stop, brothers, please let me know. Okay, it's your function. I'm only here answering according to your needs. So whenever, brother Osman, five minutes, inshallah. So the four wives, I tell you what happened. It's, it came as a restriction and an allowance because in the early times, when there were so many battles that the Muslims engaged in, so many males died in those battles at a time when the Muslims were very few. So many female Muslims were left behind. And that problem had to be solved in an Islamic fashion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the allowance that if you are unable to be just to the orphans produced because of the death of those martyrs, the males, then you may marry up to four so that you can help that community at that early age. And then in Surah An-Nisa, وَلَن تَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ And then again in Surah An-Nisa, it says, وَإِذَا عَدَلْتُمْ فَوَاحِدَةً that if it says you have to be just but if you cannot be just then it is only one one and only one and then in surah an-nisa it says you will never never be able to establish justice absolute justice among women even if you try therefore the answer is very clear so it is not an open-ended allowance no but islam came to solve every problem not only the problems of the majority, but even the minority, they have something in Islam to address their needs. What should be the role of Muslim women in spreading Islam? Behaving as Muslim women, just by putting on that beautiful identity. By the way, the reason that our women you see, have you ever attended a lecture called Role of Christian Women in Society? Rarely. They talk about role of Muslim women. You know why? Because we accepted this as stereotype. Why? Because whether we like it or not, our sisters are the most visible identity of Islam, and we are proud of it. The most visible identity. So the best way to do da'wah as sisters is you see i read recently in an islamic magazine coming from saudi arabia that there was one turkish sister in germany 
in, in Germany, there's a big uh, uh, Turkish community in Germany. One Muslim sister was able to get her whole neighborhood to accept Islam because of her behavior. She didn't go and give lectures. She didn't, and it was reported. The whole neighborhood accepted Islam because of her behavior. So Alhamdulillah, if you have friends, if you have neighbors, just, you see, whenever you have Eid, take a little bit of sweets, knock at their door and say, it is our Eid. I would like to give you something. You know, be friends with them. Some of them may give you dirty looks, but smile in their face. You see, things like that. I cannot really go in detail because I was told five minutes, it's already five. So I will try to read quickly. In reference to marriage in Islam, is it true that Al-Quran states it is permissible for a Muslim man to marry a non-Muslim woman, but not for a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man? Yes, it is true. If it is true, why is it so? By the way, brothers and sisters, many, many Muslims and non-Muslims look at a Muslim man marrying a non-Muslim woman as a privilege. They look at it like it's, it's a big honor. So why can't the Muslim women have the same right? Had it been something other than a big honor or a privilege, they wouldn't even talk about it. You see, people like to get equal treatment of things that are really favorable. So they look at it like, oh, he married a developed girl. Brothers and sisters, it is not. See, even again, we read in, in, in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that even a slave believer is better than a free non-Muslim woman. It says that. You know why? Because the secret of a happy family is harmony. If you don't have harmony in the family, you will not have happiness. Very few families survived when there were religious differences. But if your question is, why not Muslim women? Because the majority of societies, it is the man that determines the religious identity of the children. And because Islam came as the final message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't go backward, but you bring people forward with you. You bring people ba uh, uh, forward with you. So that's why it is not a privilege, but it is an allowance and it really needs more time. Yes, brother. Um, in the translation uh, of the Quran, the English translation, it says that men are a degree above women. Does this mean they're not okay? If you remember, I don't know if you were here for Jummah prayer, I said you can never translate the Quran. Never. You can only interpret the meanings of the Quran. This is one of the many examples I have noticed in even the authentic or nearly authentic translation of Abdullah Yusuf Ali. There are many mistakes in that so-called attempt to translate. I'll tell you, this degree, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ daraja, that men have a degree over them is not in status but in financial support. And this is why they give them the mahr or the gift of marriage before the nikah takes place. So this degree, because if you continue that ayah, it says by the uh, uh, reason of spending from their money. This is the way that they have this one extra degree. So it is not status. In the family, they are all equal. You know why equal? Because they have equal access to their rights. The man has the same access to his rights as the woman has to her rights. The rights of the woman are totally protected. I was talking with the brother about a man coming to his wife, getting fed up with his wife. You know, he wanted to have something new. He says, okay, you're divorced. And some people think that, well, by saying that, now he can go and seek another marriage and... Uh, no, it cannot happen that way because if she proves it to the hakim, to the emir of the ummah that this man's intentions are such and such, the hakim can bring him, reprimand him, and if, if it is the first time that he does it, 
He can put restrictions on him to prevent him from just saying it simply because he felt like it. Islam protects the rights of women, but all we need to do is to study it. How can you judge something that you don't know? Brothers and sisters, Islam is for us to enjoy, to know. But unfortunately, you know, inshallah, you will have this event, an annual event, and you will have more of it. Why? Because unless we really get to know our Islam, we will continue to misunderstand it and misjudge it. And you will find even some Muslims themselves in their private meetings. I, many people told me, and they criticize, they criticize the Quran. They give themselves the liberty to criticize the Quran. Astaghfirullah. Yes, brother. And therefore, um, you live with you for a short time. And what are the halal forms of entertaining um, your relatives or your friends at the wedding function? Okay, the halal form goes to the principle of modesty. Women and men cannot expose their modesty in front of each other if they are not uh, maharim, which means if they are not lawfully uh, related to each other and that was specified in Surah An-Nur and and you know it, it, it lists all the people that you can show your zina in front your husband your father your son your uh, father-in-law and the and list goes on so for entertainment the rules are very simple you cannot let the women sing in front of men if they have to sing, they have to sing in their own company because if the men hear somebody singing or they see what they are doing, they may see some of the modesty exposed in front of them and this is not right. So the way of entertainment, you can have walima. You know, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, every time he got married, he did a walima, even though his ability was not as you know, some people today, they borrow from the bank to pay for the wedding. Many of you can relate to that. Brothers and sisters, this is unwarranted. This is unacceptable. Unacceptable. You borrow from... I, I know it. And they pay riba. They pay riba. Why? Because they want to put on the best wedding of the century. Well, already Prince Charles did that and look what happened to him. <laughs> So be very careful. You can entertain, but the rule for everything, keep modesty. And that's why, you know, we treasure our Islam. Yes, brother. Is it permissible for the women to wear makeup and perfume for masjid? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Simple and clear, no. Okay, and, and you see, and, and here, here, we shouldn't enter into confrontation, but I put makeup, you have no right to say I don't, but sisters, okay, many of us have our own shortcomings. If we have them, we should not, you see, if we, you know what that means when he stood to my right, okay, so it means I have to finish. That will be the last statement I make. If I have a shortcoming, I have no right to defend it. You know the best thing to do? The best thing to do is to say, oh Allah, help me to realize my shortcomings and find a solution for them. But you ask me, is it permissible? I'm not going to beat around the bush. I say no with capital letters. Not only to the masjid, by the way. I'm glad I mentioned this. A woman is not allowed to put on makeup or perfume outside her house. Not only masjid. Outside the house, it's not permitted. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.